Good evening and welcome to Imperial Lates Online Staying Connected, the latest in our new public event series exploring research at Imperial College London. This week, Lates program has mostly looked at human connections in the digital world via remote communication technology. Tonight, we are going to be discussing how we can create meaningful interactions when working online. My name is Natasha Houghton. I'm a medical doctor as well as a teacher here at Imperial, and I will be hosting our discussion this evening. Before we begin, I want to remind you all watching at home that this is an interactive event. So please do send us your questions and your thoughts. One of our team is working away in the background, commenting in and monitoring the YouTube chat, and will be passing on your comments to me to read out or to put to our guests. Please, could I just ask everybody to be considerate of others when you are posting in the live chat? We want to create a positive and welcoming space for this online discussion, and we will be removing any comments that are explicit, offensive, or disrupt the experience for others. Excellent, so if that's all understood, let's get started. The COVID-19 pandemic has revolutionized the way we interact with others, bringing online communication to the forefront of our working lives. Adapting effectively to this environment is crucial. So how do we do it? Well, joining me to explore this question tonight are a group of people who all do very different things, but who also all need to be highly skilled at creating meaningful interactions to do their jobs well. I'm going to introduce them to you now. Our first guest is an international award-winning magician. In addition to performing, he specializes in consultancy for media and advertising, and he holds a PhD in the history of Victorian conjuring. I'm pleased to welcome Will Houston. Next, I would like to introduce one of Britain's leading harpsichordists. She has performed as a soloist in Europe, the United States, and Japan, and she also teaches both privately and at conservatoires, including the Royal College of Music. This is Sophie Yates. Our third guest is also a musician by training, but his career has taken him in all kinds of directions. During his early working life, he specialized in plucked string instruments, particularly the lute, and founded the Defy Collective, a medieval ensemble with which he toured the world, particularly spending a lot of time in the Middle East. He's since worked in film and television as a documentary producer, and in a further change of career, in recent years, he has become a secondary school teacher and a faculty head at Rural Comprehensives. Welcome, Bill Badley. Hello. Our final guest is a professor of surgical education <clears throat> and engagement science at Imperial College London. He has been a surgeon, a GP, an educator, and an academic. I'm pleased to welcome Roger Nebo. Now, Roger, much of your work explores issues that cross traditional boundaries between disciplines and looks at how we can learn from the expertise of people who, on the surface of things, do something completely different to us. Could you tell us a little bit about that, perhaps, and how the collaboration came about between yourself and the other guests here tonight? Yes. Um, so this, this started many, many years ago when I was... Uh, a GP in the southwest of England. At that stage, I'd, I'd already had one phase in my career. I trained as a trauma surgeon, doing a lot of work in Southern Africa. And then I changed direction. I became a GP and I became interested in playing the harpsichord. I, I, I'd, I'd never played one before and I was just, just beginning. Um, when I, uh, I was put in touch with Sophie Yates um, and we started having lessons. And I've been having lessons with Sophie for, for many, many years now. At the time when, when I started having these lessons, um, I was also, I was teaching GPs how to do surgical procedures because of my background in surgery. And I, I remember clearly struggling with how to convey to these GPs things that to me as a trained surgeon seemed pretty obvious, but to the GPs were not at all obvious and they, they were struggling. And at that time I was having lessons with Sophie where I myself, as a beginner, was struggling with things that to Sophie uh, were clearly uh, very obvious. And and I suddenly made the connection between the way Sophie was teaching me, how she was explaining how to hold my 
hands and fingers next to the keyboard and, and how to uh, how to move them in particular ways. And it occurred to me that there were similarities there with uh, somebody very experienced, very expert, teaching somebody uh, very inexperienced, very inexpert in, in my case. And I was doing something like that, uh, although with things turned around a bit uh, with the GPs. Um, and so it, it made me think that the two worlds that appear completely different, music and medicine, might actually have more in common than you, than you might think, particularly when you're thinking about what people do with their hands. And then many years later, um, I, I put together a, 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 a one-day event exploring that idea further, but this time to look at what surgeons and magicians might have in common. And one of the magicians at that event was Will Houston, who's with us today. And again, rather to my surprise, it appeared, it, it became clear that actually there was a surprising amount in common between these people who, whose line of work was so very different, but whose actual work itself seemed surprisingly similar. And from then I've been exploring more and more this idea of what we can learn from people outside our own area of expertise, but who do things that may be similar. And since the lockdown, since everything's changed with, with the way we teach and learn, we've all of us been thinking more and more about what we can learn from one another, about how to respond to these extraordinary times that we're living through at the moment. Thank you, Roger. Um, and, and when the lockdown started, um, Roger brought all of us here together in that philosophy um, to discuss, to document, to record and adapt together. And one of the things that kept coming up again and again in our discussions throughout that time was um, how important it was to create meaningful interactions in, in our work and how challenging this was under the current circumstances. So let me give you an example. As a doctor, it's essential that I, I can rapidly win the trust of my patients when I interact with them. Um, not only so that we can have an effective exchange of information, but also so that they can have confidence in me and confidence in what I can do for them. Um, and it may not necessarily be as obvious to, to all of our listeners how that works in, in magic and in, in music and, and in other fields. So I would like now just to ask our guests to talk a little bit about what they do and why meaningful interactions are key to that. Um, Will, would you like to start for us? Certainly. Uh, so I am a magician and interaction is very much at the heart of everything that magicians do. Uh, a lot of people, I suspect, think that magic is all about sleight of hand and special props and these sorts of things. Uh, and those certainly are things that are included in the world of magic, but they're not themselves magic. Uh, they are tools which you can use to create an experience for somebody else which is magic, that bit when you see something impossible seem to happen, even though you know it couldn't possibly have happened. Uh, and that bit only happens with somebody else. So if you want to be a magician, you have to be able to show magic to somebody else. Uh, you have to be able to tell them the right story that leads to this little impossible moment. And that can only happen when you're having a genuine interaction with that person where they know that it's happening in this particular way, in this particular time between you and them, and it will never be the same in any other situation with any other group of people. At the other aspect of my work where interaction comes into play is teaching. Uh, I do quite a lot of work teaching other magicians how they can do magic. Uh, and again, if you're teaching somebody, you have to be able to interact with them because you have to be able to see what they're doing uh, to understand what they're trying to achieve and to see where they're falling short of what they're trying to achieve and then to work with them to help them develop the skills they need. So perhaps you need to interact to work on technical skills uh, to develop the way that they manipulate things or maybe it's about the stories they're telling, the presentation, the way they do their magic. Uh, all of these things again require you to interact with the person because it's only in that collaboration between two people where you can make any progress. Thank you, Will. Um, Sophie, would you like to tell us a bit about your perspective on this? Well, as a harpsichordist, I am already trying to take my listeners into a different 
a different a different time really i focus on period performance and play music from the 16th to the 18th centuries mostly so there is there is um a leap that the listener has to make and that that interaction is um a little bit like will was saying it's it's rather sort of a quintessential thing um for me as a teacher i need to be able to hear what my students are playing in great detail and the harpsichord isn't well as an 18th century instrument isn't particularly well set up for for 21st century technology um it's like every plucked instrument it relies heavily on resonance uh the resonance of the sound in in a in a room in an acoustic and that again is a very subtle thing um just for people who are not familiar with the harpsichord the strings are plucked with this little thing here the, the jack um with that tiny plectrum um, so when i press a key that plectrum plucks a string and the instrument resonates so i might just play you a little bit of something so you can hear um So um, hopefully that was a little, <laughs> little taste of the 18th century in 21st century technology. Thank you, Sophie. That's that's great and fascinating as always. And Bill, like Sophie, you were also a musician and, and also a teacher um, yeah. and also married to Sophie. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> we're actually separated by a floor. She's downstairs, I'm bloody <laughs> upstairs. Um, but your perspective is not exactly the same because the sort of music and the sort of teaching you do is quite different. Could you tell us a bit about that? Well, yes, I, I uh, Sophie and I met at the Royal College of Music where I was studying the lute and she was studying the harpsichord. And um, when you become a secondary school teacher, you, you have to really broaden right out so that you can you can bring a, a very wide range of musical experiences to, to our students. And I suppose the first challenge is to deconstruct your own learning, the things that, as Roger was saying, something which seems quite obvious to someone who spent many hours trying to develop their own skills. And deconstruct those things in a, in a way that you can present that and make it uh, accessible to your students. So uh, part of that is a pedagogical, if you like, almost a, a structural thing of, of trying to um, cut your understanding into small pieces so that you can feed that out to your students. But it's also about creating an environment which is nurturing. It's creating an environment, hopefully, which is encouraging and, and interesting. Um, and ultimately, what you're trying to do, I suppose, is, is to make your, render yourself redundant by giving your students such a sense of autonomy that they can proceed on their own and that's ultimately what what an awful lot of musicians end up doing is spending a lot of time on their own refining their own skills and what i'm trying to do is to is to help my students move towards that um and, and much of that is about developing relationships albeit in in my case often that's developing relationships with with small groups or even large groups you know groups up to 30 students and trying to enhance the dynamic of that group so that they're able to put themselves on the line and experience music and that that is a, a there are a number of things going on there and after after a while you get used to to handling that in in some ways which is why moving into the digital domain and into um uh, into a remote teaching it presents a number of challenges which uh, which we're all um, 
I wouldn't say struggling with, but we're also all challenged by at the moment. Exactly. Thank you, Bill. And I mean, I think it would be fair to say then that all of our guests tonight have spent years cultivating the ability to make interactions work well. And and the arrival of coronavirus and, and the lockdown really did turn a lot of that on its head. And I think before we can look at how we adapt to this environment, it's it's worth looking a little bit at the impact that it has had on us. And one of the things while we've been documenting and analyzing this transition that comes up again and again is that it can be very challenging, not only to understand um, online, but also to make yourself understood. And Will, I think that you have shared a few insights on this previously. Um, could I ask you to speak to that? Certainly. Um, so I thought it might be interesting just to give people an idea of the kinds of things that a student might be trying to learn in a magic lesson uh, to show you something and then you'll I think see uh, why that might be difficult to share when you're in a different space with all of these other constraints. Uh, so perhaps if I can be spotlit for a moment uh, I can show you a little thing called a flourish. Uh, so most of the time skill is kept hidden in magic tricks but there is a, a little genre called flourishing uh, where you make that skill very apparent. Uh, so I'll show you a little technical, skillful thing uh, using a pack of cards on a different camera so that hopefully you can see. Uh, so the idea of this little flourish is to start off by cutting the cards in half. Uh, and when I say in half, I do mean in half. There are 52 cards in the pack, so I'm aiming for 26 uh, in each of these piles. Uh, once they've been cut, you shuffle the cards together, uh, sort of pushing them together as you might see people shuffling uh, on a regular basis. But again, this is a fairly precise shuffle. Uh, the cards are actually alternating uh, perfectly from one side to the other all of the way through. Now, once you do that, if you push the cards together uh, a little bit, uh, you can set them up so that there is a single playing card's thickness of gap in between each pair on each side. And that allows you to do something rather unusual. If you pull the cards out almost all the way, but not quite all the way, and then relax just enough that they start to fall, but no further, uh, you find that you can make the cards sort of blossom outwards into these two little pretty fans, uh, which then close up together nice and neatly. Uh, so that is the kind of thing that I might be trying to teach somebody uh, if I was doing a lesson or at least something analogous to that. Uh, and you can imagine that's quite hard with a camera mediating everything. Uh, they can't choose their perspective so easily, the way they're looking at my hands. I can't see their hands. Even if I can see their hands clearly, perhaps I can't see their shoulders, so I can't see that there's tension in their body that's not helping. Uh, there are all sorts of different clues and cues that you would normally use to teach somebody in person, uh, which just aren't present when you're trying to teach somebody in this online setting. And Roger, I imagine that you see quite a lot of parallels there with, with trying to teach particularly practical procedures in medicine as well. Yeah, I think so, absolutely. The, the, I mean, I think there's this whole question of how you can how you can engage effectively with people through pretty much through vision and sound, but without touch and and the other senses. And so, getting a, a, a sense, as Will was saying, of, of I mean, in his case, with the with the flourish of how much tension to give it. There are many clinical procedures, for example, where that's very important if you're putting in a a line into an artery or vein or something like that, or, or doing any kind of <clears throat> any kind of clinical procedure, or even um, learning to to percuss somebody's chest or listen with your stethoscope and how hard you press things and all, all, all that kind of thing. This is all stuff that that is that is very easy to correct or to to shape how somebody's doing things if if you're there with them. <clears throat> but when you're trying to teach them to do something that 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 to you is second nature, but to them they haven't done before or haven't done very much. It's 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 very difficult, and and I had an experience just the other day when I was having a, a lesson with Sophie, actually, turning that round because because we were struggling. I was struggling with something that Sophie could spot immediately that it was a problem with how I was holding my hand, and, and it was a, quite a subtle thing with with the angle of the of the fingers on the wrist, um, and and how to make make some sort of small change that made a big difference, but but. Whereas previously, Sophie would just have been able to put her hand over mine and say, Roger, look, just move it slightly that way. She was trying 
So if you were trying to try various ways, weren't you? you? You were trying to show me on the screen, but that wasn't easy. You were trying to put it into words and that wasn't easy. And there were all sorts of sort of workarounds. We were trying to trying to 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 come together to 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 convey that in a way that was it highlighted to me what are some of the the limitations as well as some of the the interesting advantages of of relying so much on on vision and and hearing it, it meant that it meant that the, getting that point across took a lot longer than mm. it would have done in in real life and and because of the distortion of the camera i had to experiment quite a lot to to show it to you clearly yes that was very interesting because because it was happening in a particular in a particular plane um so if you're uh if the camera is looking in one direction it will see that sort of movement but it, it may not see the sideways movement nearly so much and so you're having to try and work out what the technology will allow you to convey i think uh in a in a way that that just the simple putting your hand on somebody else's and showing them cuts through all that doesn't it whereas yes. whereas if that, if that's the one thing you can't do it brings into prominence the the extent to which you normally rely on that sort of thing i think without even realizing it yes also, I find that the um, the online scenario can be a little stilted. In, we're, we're all paying such great attention to setting ourselves up so we can be seen clearly and our technique is visible and, and we can be heard properly and hear the others. But that can lead to a, a lack of spontaneity in a lesson. So I might have an idea that a, a piece someone's having a problem with could be the problem could be solved by looking at a similar piece a diff in a different context um, but then I've got to go and find the score and get the score to them and mark it up in a certain way all of which could be done really quickly and easily were they in my house and that can be quite frustrating when you're the communicator when you're trying to give information to someone but I guess equally it can be quite frustrating for the person who's receiving the information and I do wonder, Bill, I'm aware that you're working with young people, with teenagers, with people who are very much digital natives. Do you find yeah. that that's sort of a two-way frustration? Somehow? Yes, I, th I think it is. And one of the things I've been, I've been chatting to some of my colleagues today about, about their experiences. And one of the things is that most people, not most, a lot of people over the age of 30 are, they might be digitally literate, but they're not necessarily comfortable within the remote environment whereas most people under the age of 20 it's that they're, they're citizens of that world um and so you go from being the in the situation you're used to which is of being the authority and i, I know as teachers are often trying to break that down and trying to trying to have a more level um communication but we're we're, we're used to being the authority and what we find ourselves doing is often being the shambling amateur uh, and the and, and the students actually are, re are really quite um, quite together with this and quite confident with the way it works and this really really came to me I tried to do a, a lesson I've, I've done a few lessons with with small groups sort of tutoring groups of, of seven or eight and I tried to have a whole group of 30 year eights that's so that's sort of 13 year olds um, and it was going well, and I was really struggling with the technology, which is the first way to make yourself look inept. But what I hadn't realised is that they were, because they were so fluent with the technology, they were all doing the equivalent of passing notes around the back back row, because they had all gone onto a different app and they were all commenting on what I was doing. Um, and you know, having a whale of a time. I mean, for them, it was a wonderful spectator sport seeing me. Turn increasingly red in the face, and now, or in, in a, you could say that actually, I mean, I did have comments after them, for some, some of them afterwards, saying, you know, that was very sporting of you, to 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 do that. But um, nonetheless, it, it it doesn't create flow. It doesn't give anybody a great deal of confidence in you. Um, and I think if I hadn't had an, a, an already established relationship. Um, with, with those students, if they hadn't already got to know me and I got to know them and there was a, a, an element of trust, it would have been 
very difficult to have rescued that situation. As it was, we all digitally giggled about it afterwards. But I think um, if that had been the first time they'd encountered me, I think they would have thought, who's this duffer? You know? um, and that wasn't necessarily because my understanding of the subject was was not there or I hadn't considered it. It was simply because my means of communication were, were, were lacking. And I think you, sorry, Roger, what, over to you. No, I was just going to make, make another point. What you were talking, it made me think that that this remorseless, un, unremitting face-to-face -face, um, eye contact mm. is also very peculiar because you would never normally do that. If you were in a group of, of five, as we are, you know, you'd, you'd see the side of somebody's face and the other side of another person's face and things. And actually, a, a lot of communication goes on when you're not absolutely face-to-face, -face, as we all know, I suppose, from the conversations you have sometimes with your passenger when you're driving and you're both looking ahead rather than at one another can be quite different from the conversations you have face to face. And indeed, one of the hairdressers I've been working with a lot uh, in, in exploring ideas about what it is to become expert talks about how, you know, how hairdressers become very familiar with, with approaching people who can only see them in the mirror and they do it from the side or the back because they know that immediate confrontational eye contact can be very difficult. And it seems to me that this this kind of <clears throat> kind of way of perceiving other people which we're all which we're all doing right now is is highly un, 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 unnatural in many ways because normally uh, presumably in a in a class bill you'd have people disposed around the room and you know you you'd probably be moving and you wouldn't be looking directly at all 38 people's faces eye, eye on no and, and you would be giving them you'd be giving them time to think things through you'd be giving them time to discuss <clears> things you'd be there are all i mean there are you know any number of strategies that you would use to mm. to enhance the learning experience and and this as you say it's a it's very intense um and um you do i mean you do feel that you have to in some way keep a performance going and that that puts a focus on on the educator it, it, which is quite unnatural in today's classroom. That probably would have been, funnily enough, that would have been more familiar to, to my forebears who were teaching in the 1950s. So, think, actually, sorry, Will. I was just going to say, I think another point on the eye contact thing is that in this medium, you don't get those breaks from it, but you also don't get it in the same way you do in real life. So if I feel like I'm talking to you, I'm looking at Sophie, for example, at the moment, my eyes are certainly not going to be looking dead into your eyes as far as you're concerned, uh, I have to look away from her and into the camera. And if I look into the camera, then it feels like I'm looking directly at you. So you get this sort of other layer of artificiality in it uh, where you have to look away from somebody's eyes to create the feeling of looking into them. And I guess what we come to there is that these things are uncomfortable and it's not always natural. And it's not always easy just to take what you've known how to do very well and translate it directly online. And I think that's what we want to come into talking about now is how we have adapted and how we've actually changed to try to make this less uncomfortable. Now, just before we go on to talk about some of those adaptations and the way we're responding to those challenges, I just want to um, remind everybody that we are taking questions. We'll have some specific time to answer questions at the end of the session, but please do keep um, asking throughout. Um, and I just want to share before we move on to the next thing, one comment um, from somebody watching tonight. That's from Anne Carr, who says that we have found that our full team updates, which have 50 plus people, work better online using chat comments. It's much more inclusive and easier for people to do a plus one or respond to someone else's comment. And actually, thank you, Anne. I think that's a really useful comment. And that's actually one of the things we want to talk about in the next section, because as well as just having lost things and just making adaptations to make it not as bad, we too have really found that some things are in mm. fact actually better online. Um, and one of the ways that we've gone about trying to find these things is instead of thinking what normally happens, going right back to basics and thinking about what are the actual key elements, what are the first principles of any interaction. And Will, you've spoken a bit about this to me in the past. Um, but I ask you to pick up on that point. Yeah, certainly. Um, so I think one of the big things that's been helpful for magicians, and I've been working with a friend at looking at how magic on video chat platforms can work, is to remember that this is almost a different performance space. 
And in the same way as a magician, you would do a very different trick if you were sitting in a pub with your friends compared to if you were standing on stage in front of 3,000 people. Uh, you should also probably think about what you're doing in a very different way if you're doing something on a video platform like this uh, than if you're doing something in person with somebody. Uh, and I think just trying to remember that it's a different performance space allows you to then say, what are the advantages I have in this space? Uh, what are the disadvantages or the flaws I have to try and work around? And then to work out the most productive version of what you do in this space, uh, rather than always doing a kind of compromised version of something that works in a different space, but really isn't meant to work in this one. And yes, I mean, sorry, I was just going to, following on from that, I mean, one of the things that, that uh, a lot of my colleagues have identified is that is that the skills required to do really effective online teaching for a club for classes is it's a whole new rank of skills i mean so you've got teachers who can can orchestrate a class really well can you know use lots of different strategies and they've they've had to suddenly become you know, um, cottage industry television producers, um, you know, creating this sort of online content. And of course, in that, you, you know, you're working out of your bedroom. Uh, and for students who are used to things that are produced by the Marvel Corporation, you know, so it's, it's a, there's a whole new, um, you know, it's a whole new ch challenge, or you could say opportunity for, for, for teachers in that regard. Hmm. It brings different things to the fore, doesn't it? I mean, one thing I have found very helpful is people getting used to being more explicit about uh, their needs, because I have to. Um, and I actually have to be much clearer about what I want from my students in terms of their behaviour in the lesson, you know, special special to being in the in this scenario. So, for example, um, leaving a little bit of space in between a comment that I might make and their and their playing. So, if I comment on something they're doing, then they play instantly. Then they're going to be playing across what I'm saying, and it's all going. To, I'm going to have to repeat myself, etc. So that so actually actually asking for a different sort of conduct can be really helpful. Also, so, uh, another thing is um, we've been we've been record. My students have been recording a lot more and sending me their recordings, uh, which is especially helpful when when the when the sound isn't that great, um, and and that's somewhat taken the place of public performance um, and they can appraise themselves like that so we're using re recording much more. It's a very interesting point Sophie because for a long time we've been talking about using recording more in, in medicine and particularly in medical education and particularly when we're training medical students as a tool for reflecting, a tool for yes. practicing, a tool for feedback and that's really struggled for many many years to be perhaps as widely used as it could be and i just think there's such wonderful opportunities now that everyone is becoming a digital native as it were to really start to see those things take off i mean it's something that in, that in class music education we've been doing for the last 20 years um you know going back to uh, you know the teacher coming around with a cassette or whatever that that's that's something that that um that students are, are very used to listening back to themselves but it uh, um I'm, I'm often surprised that it isn't used more i think there is also there is something about the camera which changes the environment i think if we're just talking about audio that's quite different to to people suddenly finding themselves on screen and i know that before i became a teacher and i was making documentaries out in the middle east the moment you brought a camera into the room it changed the dynamic Whereas I've done a lot of field recordings of musicians before that with just with a microphone and people very quickly forgot about it. But there is something about the camera which people act up to. And I think that that is something or they act up to or they're intimidated by. It. And so I think it's that's something that uh, I, I think we have to factor in in our in our teaching. When I when I first met Sophie, I was a GP, as I said, and I was I was a tr trainer of GPs. GPs would come and spend 
a year at a time. And I, I practiced. And, and when I was becoming a trainer, I, I went on a course which required us all, all, all sort of aspiring trainers to record consultations. And at that time, you needed quite a big video camera. It was plumped on the wall or on a tripod. So it was very evident in the consultation. Although surprisingly quickly, the patients didn't seem to mind. But but the, the interesting thing to me was that the the GPs, when we when we looked at our video consultations afterwards with a with a tutor, everybody was extremely uncomfortable because we'd never seen ourselves um, consulting before, and and so what people were, were were terrified was that they would they would not show themselves off in the best light or they'd you know be clear that they'd missed a diagnosis or something like that. What what the training was actually about was looking at the dynamics of the consultation and how you can make a, a rapport with your patient, how you can sort of listen to what their problem is, all that kind of thing that I think uh, from conversations that we've had with, with Will and Sophie actually have a lot of common ground with other kinds of performance, although I didn't see it in those terms at the time. But but it was completely outside our experience to be videoed and then watch one another's consultations. And I think one of the things that's happening now maybe is that that's becoming more second nature. So if you're not, not just with the recordings of a musical performance, but with recordings of, a, of an encounter like this. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think that's certainly something that magicians as performers, so somebody who's doing a show gains enormously from, um, because there's something very elucidating about watching back a show a couple of days after you've done it uh, in a full recording. And normally, if you were doing a live show, you would have most of the stage in shot, perhaps. Maybe you have a couple of people who come up on stage and you can see them. If you're doing a show via Zoom, you can record the entire thing. You can have a full recording of gallery view and you can see exactly when your spectators are looking away, exactly when they're engaged, exactly when they're bored and they're checking their phones. Uh, and you can get so much more information automatically at a show without doing anything extra uh, than you could with a video camera in real life, uh, which I guess is one of those advantages, one of the things that comes up in this setting that's perhaps better than anywhere else. Most interesting. Um, another thing I wanted to pick up on, earlier Bill said that particularly young people are quite used, and all of us in fact, are used to watching very high production, high value um, material online and on television and okay we're not going to be marvel studios but there are some things that we can do um to try to make ourselves a bit better um will uh, you have a relatively extensive home setup for just this do you want to show us a little bit about how you actively manage your environment sure so again sort of in the early days of figuring out that these shows are going to be a thing for magicians uh, a friend and I who are running a project thought we should find somebody who does have expertise in this, who can help us uh, to do it better. Uh, and as it happens, we ended up with somebody who's a cinematographer uh, for Hollywood films, including some Marvel ones. Uh, so he's the chap who did the cinematography for Watchmen, for 300, uh, for the most recent Batman film. Uh, and we said to him, we would like some tips which you can give people who just want to use their laptop and not spend anything, uh, some things that maybe are cheap and easy to apply, uh, and then some things perhaps that somebody who's doing a lot of this and wants to spend some money on can do. Uh, and it's astonishing, I think, how quickly smallish things make a difference. Um, so an example of that might be that I bought a little light. Uh, it's one extra light. It cost me, I think, 40 pounds or thereabouts. If I turn it off, uh, you'll see that everything looks rather Gosh. bad. Uh, wow, that's I really, can... really clear how, how that changes everything. And again, it changes everything. Uh, I'm using my phone camera uh, rather than my computer's one. If I change to the computer one, you can see it's this very kind of weird shot, which is foreshortened and looks a little bit odd. Uh, if I pop back over to the one that my uh, telephone is doing, it's much higher quality, it's got a much better focus, much better resolution. Uh, and so, yeah, those sort of all sorts of little bits which don't take a huge amount, um, but which I think do make a big difference. Uh, and I guess that point that you made, Bill, really, about us not being experts in this is central to that because there are people who do know these things easily. Um, and yeah, sometimes it's possible to get tips from them. I mean, I think I, I think you're right. And I think that, that um, everybody but i think particularly educators are at the beginning of quite a steep learning curve and i think that that what the what the recent pandemic has done is forced people in, into uh, engaging with things that um you know 
uh, and in the same way with audio recording, I mean, I remember even 10 years ago, you would marvel at what somebody could do in a recording studio. And now if you buy a Mac, you've got GarageBand and it's all there for you. And and, and I, I hear things that are recorded by 12 year olds, which are staggering um, because you can't, you, you know, they can learn how to do it at home. So I think, so I, think that, I think we are just at the beginning of a, of a learning curve. But I think as, as well as learning from experts like you know, Hollywood uh, teams making Batman films, we can learn from one another. I mean, what, Will, what you were saying about the question of eye contact, I think is, is really important. You know, unless you thought this through, you may think that just because you can see somebody, they can see you. Uh, and, and of course, they can't. And, and I'm sure you have relatively simple tips that you could put on the side of A4 that would, that would help people uh, manage that business of, of, of how you make people feel that you are looking at them even when you're not or that you're not even when you are, you know, all that kind of thing. But, but and a conversation like this with, with, with a sort of diverse group as we are, and I'm sure there are many other, many other groups you could think of as well, could be very helpful, couldn't they, in, in pulling out some of those things that are obvious to some people but not obvious but yet important to others. Absolutely. And, you know, I found it extremely helpful as we've been making this transition to to have ongoing conversations and document and analyze with other people who are interested in, in following the same learning curve. And even despite that, though, things don't always go well. And, and sometimes it's inevitable that things do go wrong and, and we have to be prepared for that. Um, so I guess I'll put it out to the group what do you, how do you manage that? And what do you do when it does go wrong? Well, I think one of the interesting things is interpreting technological hitches. When it, when it, when it freezes, very often I think that somebody is paying me more than the usual amount of attention to what I'm just saying. <laughs> and then it turns out that there's been an internet failure and they're not there at all. And, and so <laughs> how you, how you manage that and how you, respond to it, I think, is is worth thinking through, you know, how you deal with technological glitches that, that are always going to happen, particularly the ones that aren't obvious for a little while anyway. And I mean, I think certainly in the medical context, Natasha, we've had conversations about this, haven't you, where, where silence can be very effective when you're trying to create a, a setting where people, somebody feels comfortable in telling you what's really important. And mm. actually, you may feel that they're about to do that. But yet again, the signals dropped out and that you know you can you, you can have problems can't you absolutely and i think one of the really key things is having a plan for what you're going to do um when when things don't go well but it's also knowing when to when you need to acknowledge that something's gone wrong and when you can just sort of brush past it and i think well this is not a new concept because this is something that that you were doing long before things were digital as well yeah absolutely and you know, sometimes I think a plan can be that if this thing happens, then I'll do this and nobody will notice and it'll seem like it was always meant to be that way. Uh, sometimes a plan for what to do if something goes wrong is to have the person's phone number so you can send them a text saying, I'm really sorry, it's gone wrong, my internet's broken. Uh, I'll text you in 15 minutes when it's good again. Um, but just having some idea of what happens, I think, is hugely helpful. Uh, I also think maybe now is the best time to be making mistakes in this space because everyone's new to it. Nobody really has a good handle on it. Nobody really knows exactly what the standard should be. Uh, and so now's the perfect time not to do it so well because people haven't decided what well is yet. So, so it's, it's not only us who sometimes are, are, you know, not doing very well or having problems. Um, I mean, getting one student's um, situation right, I found can also be quite obtrusive at the beginning of the lesson you know actually I can only see half the keyboard or uh, you know it can take quite a long time to actually get help them to get their setup sorted mm -hmm. out so that so that we can get on with the lesson and then you feel oh gosh hang on that's that's a quarter of the lesson and actually this is not what the lesson's about <laughs> so I think that I mean I think that's a great point. I'm aware that we are running short on time and I'd like to leave a little bit of time for questions if possible. But I think what I'm hearing there and what Sophie and Will and Roger are all saying is that sometimes things will go wrong. And actually what we need to do is approach this with a little bit of 
compassion and a little bit of kindness towards ourselves and our colleagues and our students, um, whoever they may be, and understand that we're all on, you know, a learning curve and it, it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, yeah, I, I think have, that's I, have you, sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I have had students who said to me that actually they really like the working this way because um, they're able to play back what's been explained, something that might have shot past their ear in, in, in a lesson for whatever reason, or they didn't get it and they didn't feel comfortable about asking a question, they can play it back again. Um, and I think that it's important to think that the kind of face-to-face -face, um, teaching is, is probably, eventually we'll see it as only part of the picture mm -hmm. and that, there will, that everything will be supported by um, opportunities for autonomous learning um, and then some some things will be done in small groups some things will be done in large groups almost like lectures um, and some things will be done really in a one-to-one -one as, as a tutorial so so I think we're we're getting quite understandably quite hung up on making it all work at the moment because it's the only opportunity we've got but I think that in time though hopefully it will be it will be a more mixed diet mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And actually, sorry, Roger. No, I was just going to say that there's, there's something that occurred to me, which is that as, as experienced teachers, all of us, we, I think, in a, in a normal or as, as it used to be relationship, a, a teacher would be expected to be sort of expert in all sorts of, in sorts, all sorts of areas, not, not only the, the content, but also the, the techniques of teaching and, and managing problems and, 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 different kinds of learners and all that kind of thing. And so I think for, for a lot of people, it's quite a new thing to realize that you still have all of that, but you may be, as you were saying at the beginning, Bill, you may be completely unfamiliar with handling these new, these, you, you know, technology and, and all these things. And actually having, as you were saying, Natasha, being kind to yourself and, and, and not beating, not berating yourself too much if if you're not as good at the technical side as you are at the other sides of things and kind of separating that can be quite a helpful way of thinking about it because otherwise you can i've talked to people who, who feel that just because they can't manage the technology that they're a useless waste of space in other ways and of course that's not the case at all but it's quite easy to be, to, to have your confidence shivered i think when you encounter these these things that you're not familiar with Absolutely. And actually, I think that's a really interesting point and ties in quite nicely with a comment that we've just had come in, which is that even small changes in perspectives um, about the way we view ourselves and our new professional identity in this online space can be very empowering. And we have a comment um, here that says, interesting to hear some things are better online. We often approach online interaction from the position of being forced to go there, celebrating what works better is an empowering approach. And I don't think I could have made that point any better myself. So I'm going to let that one stand um, and bring us briefly into answer a question that we had come in from Anne. If there's anybody else who would like to ask questions, please do submit now. And so Anne says, new people joining a team who have never met everyone before can be a challenge. How do you train them, give them the background they need and get them to feel that they're a part of the team? I'd have to hold my hands up and say I haven't had any experience of that yet. But I think that is a, I think that that's um, a very that's a, a very pertinent question for these times because um, in, in in my role we're starting a new school year and I, I've actually spent all today with with um, students who are absolutely new to to our school and yes having trying to create those relationships and um, bring people into the fold that is something that I think we will need to really think about I think it's an excellent question absolutely and for just which I have no answer at the moment we've had a couple of young colleagues um, join my group um, just recently who I've actually yet still to meet in person and it is harder but one of the things that I found quite useful and we've talked about before is actually deliberately and purposefully creating some space for um, conversation that isn't directly related to what you're doing. Because it can be a temptation to just immediately get down to yes. business once the Zoom meeting starts. And I actually think, you know, it, it took me weeks and weeks to find out some of the basic information that I would have known after a cup of coffee. 
Um, and next time I do it, I'm going to create virtual cups of coffee, time that's put aside at the start. It doesn't have to be a long time, five minutes to talk about people and not about the agenda. I think that's I think that's such a good point because in the same way as we're saying we need to be kinder to ourselves if things go bung, I think in the same way we need to be a little bit less frenetic about how we manage time on this and we think it has to be the full hour but the, the amount in in my role the amount of relationships you develop um by just saying to a student oh how's your brother doing now he's left school you know how's he getting on at university or or just just a small comment those sorts of little bits of badinage that happen in in, in our daily mm -hmm. life actually those are the things that create the connections and when we're mm -hmm. online i think we're all slightly kind of you know as we'll say we're all eyeballing each other or rather badly as it happens so I, th I think that's a very good point yeah i think this question of entering and leaving somebody else's space um i mean sophie you know you're you're when people come to you they they come into your place with your harpsichord and your instrument and all your music and everything and it's a uh it, it's a sort of gradual process isn't it of of, of coming into somebody else's house and and sort of re readjusting to somebody else's rhythms and and ways of doing things and all of a sudden you know you just press a button and bang you're in there on zoom it's That's it's right. it, it's not the same thing at all and so maybe we can help people sort of think about that as a, as a process that, that's that's worth paying attention to rather than just suddenly appearing as if by magic in somebody else's um on somebody else's screen and, and disappearing had, i've actually had to ask so, uh, a couple of my students if I can see their face because they've had the camera just trained on their hands and this disembodied voice <laughs> it's really not conducive to act to any kind of real human interaction I think something which highlights as well that need for the kind of social shared space uh, is I have a friend who does a, a lot of online shows I think he's done four or five hundred of them now so really a lot of them uh, and always gets feedback from people. And one of the things he started doing is at the end of the Zoom show, he'll leave, but he'll leave the chat room open so that the family who booked him have another half hour or another hour where they can be in there and they can chat and they can do the after show. I like this trick best, which trick did you like and all of that stuff. Uh, and apparently consistently, that's the thing that people say, like really made it a good experience for them, uh, which is sort of difficult to deal with if you're the person who's done the show and they say, I liked it best when you weren't there. Um, but I think it highlights how important that is, the social side of things as well. Oh, good. Well, what a lovely idea there. I'm sure that it's only because they were talking about the show because the show was the right one. <laughs> well, unfortunately, time is just about up for tonight's discussion. Thank you so much to our speakers and for everyone who joined us for this live conversation. For those watching on YouTube, apologies if we were unable to get to your questions. A recording of this discussion will soon appear on the college YouTube channel for you to watch again or share with your friends or colleagues whenever you want. There is also a link soon to be posted to the chat to an evaluation form where you can tell us what you thought of this event. Otherwise, that's it from me. Thank you to everyone who tuned in and have a good evening.